I better go and make a podcast about when I saw a UFO yeah. 30 years ago then. I mean, that, that would absolutely go crazy. If you did see a sight in a UFO... I did. Oh, is it? Seriously. No yeah. way. I did, yeah. I was, dri- I was actually driving in Kent. Yeah. Um, and the land down there, is, it was completely... F- I was driving like one o'clock at night. Yeah. You know, it's completely flat. You yeah. know, you can see like a whole horizon. No way. I'm driving along this road... And there's this great massive orange thing. No way. I'm thinking, which is slowly yeah. descending. I'm thinking, what could it be? I thought maybe it's like a hot air balloon or something. I'm yeah. thinking, I've had that hot air before, balloon yeah. at one in the mm. morning and it's so big. And I'm thinking, this thing is going to come down in the road wow. in front of my car. What yeah. am I, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. So it keeps coming down very, very slowly, and then suddenly, it stops and it just goes. Shh. It just disappeared. Yeah, it zigzagged across the sky and disappeared. Did you ever talk to anyone about it? Yeah, I tell people now. I mean, I don't know yeah. what it was. I mean, did you uh, did you get, like contact any newspapers nah, or anything? Nah. No way. No, I was about eighteen. You must have been freaked out for a while. Then. I was just amazed. I was amazed yeah. that something so big was coming down so slowly it would yeah. suddenly just zigzag across the sky and just disappear i couldn't i couldn't explain yeah. what it was i don't know what it was to this day i don't know what it was i think i could not explain an episode it. about that <laughs> that would that well, would that's be it i haven't got anything more to say <laughs> yeah i mean you <laughs> can explain it. the story what you were doing beforehand because what people do with storytelling is they, they always start I was probably out with my wife probably went yeah. out to a dance or something <laughs> yeah down in kent because we, no we, we met down there and i was coming home I was oh coming that's home. amazing coming home because i lived down there those sides then i was driving home as i say yeah. there's nothing around there's no cars there's no you know the whole horizon is yeah yeah wow that's amazing damn I wish that's, I could explain it I can't explain I, I mean I had, an, I had a similar experience but it wasn't a real I realised there was actually a Goodyear blimp okay I think that's what they're called yeah. so there was a massive blue light in the sky and I was driving up towards it but I think because of the angle of the street lights it made it look like it was an alien spaceship and I okay. panicked for a fraction of a second uh-huh. until I saw the Goodyear blimp so I don't know I think it's a Goodyear or something along the line yeah, like, no, okay. this was yeah. big, big big and orange wow that's a story and all uh, kind of that kind of shape maybe mm. but so you could say, well, it could have been that, but then it wouldn't have moved, you know, yeah. like like a flash. But, but you believe in aliens, then? Not really. No. Yeah. I don't disbelieve. You I mean, do I think there's life out there, the universe somewhere? Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. I wouldn't say that's what it was, but I don't know what it was. Yeah. The universe is humongous, so it's... it's, it's yeah, it's yeah. pretty likely that there's Something some kind of life there. somewhere. Yeah. But I don't know that's what it was. I don't know what it was. Yeah. Wow. No idea. Amazing. We'll, we'll talk about that later <laughs> on. <then. laughs> well, first of all, Dr. Hakim Abdi, I'm a professor, he's a professor, right? Professor. Not doctor, let me get it right. Professor, professor and Abdi. doctor. Professor and doctor. Oh, wow, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to welcome you to Let's Do Humans podcast. Pleasure. Um, I, I know I just got you from a, you're a keynote speaker at an event today, um, so I know you've been extremely busy. Can you tell us a bit more about the event? What was it about? And how, how did it all go? How was the, the talk that you had to you? The event went well. The event was... Uh, African Remembrance Day, which mm-hmm. is August the 1st, Amazing. which is held every year. This is the 25th yeah. um, anniversary, you could say, of the first um, event held. Mm-hmm. It's held in different places, in the, um, but it's been held several times. It's been held in a museum in Docklands yeah. in, in East London. It's a day really r- remembering particularly those who were lost or those um, who were um, affected by the human trafficking of the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. So what people call the Slavery. slave slave trade, transatlantic mm-hmm. slave trade. So it's, a, it's remembrance about that. Mm. Um, 
slavery, how comes you, how comes you, you define it as um, human trafficking? What's the, what's the difference? That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've never heard that term until I started watching some of your content online. Well, yeah. people, I think, I mean, there are different ways of explaining it. Mm. People talk about slave trade, mm -hmm. which maybe tends to... Uh, I don't know, kind of minimize it maybe in some way. Yeah. It seems like there was a trade off, so it was a fair um, transaction. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a fair transaction, or it's, yeah, it's anyway, it, it, mm. it, it kind of dehumanizes it in a way. Mm. Whereas human trafficking, we're, we're kind of more familiar with from, you know, contemporary life. So yeah. to explain it in those terms and to remember that it was. You know, African men, women, children who were mm. being trafficked across the Atlantic for hundreds of years. Yeah, and um, millions of people lost, millions of lives ruined. So that's that's what it was about. And mm. I was, or well, that's the occasion. And then I was speaking in particular about Alaudo Equano, who was a uh, Igbo. Um, actually a young boy mm. initially who was kidnapped with his sister <clears throat> in what is today Nigeria mm. was enslaved taken to uh, the Caribbean and North America as a slave yeah. um, and then he eventually managed to free himself he came to Britain Mm. And he became a, an abolitionist oh. and wrote a best-selling autobiography. Amazing about his experiences as a slave, his experiences in Africa, um, and uh, that contributed to the the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement mm -hmm. in Britain. And I was explaining that that movement, that campaign, was one of the biggest campaigns in Britain's political history. But we don't hear very much about it. I, I mean, I, I hadn't heard anything about it until I think you mentioned in one of your speeches online. Um, I didn't have a clue who the individual was and I didn't know about the story either. So it tells us a lot about what we're taught in the school system. Cause, uh, yeah, well, um, to... Ed Crano is, uh, you know, his book is published by Penguin today. It's available mm. online. Anybody can access it. Yeah. And it's a very interesting book it's it's not the only book written by an african in that period but mm -hmm. it's one of the most well known um and he's he's writing the book to to, to influence public opinion so mm -hmm. it's not just he you know he felt like writing his yeah. his memoirs but he's just trying make to make a point yeah. um especially to kind of undermine the kind of racist views of the day mm. which um, presented Africans as less than human and so on so he's trying to he you know he's writing as an African saying Africans are human Africans have feelings yeah. Africans are uh, and of course are opposed to being kidnapped and yeah. trafficked across the Atlantic in oh, wow. You know the holds of ships, you know, packed together. You know, even like yeah. worse than animals would be packed together. So he he writes about all that, and he was very important because although there was a a growing movement, a campaign in Britain mm -hmm. opposed to um, the enslavement of Africans and opposed to human trafficking, he was one of the f most prominent African voices yeah. and that movement really needed an African to speak out and of course in those days the days before podcasts and internet mm -hmm. uh, people had to write write yeah. and write books so he, he wrote his book and it, it must have been quite um, enlightening for an African who came over and was speaking a language, learning the language, and then being able to express himself. Cause it kind of humanizes him a bit more because if, if you have Africans that are unable to communicate in the language of um, yeah. the captors, how are they able to express yeah. how they feel? And how can they even be identified as humans by those who go out of their way to um, dehumanize them? That's right. Yeah. And so, you know, he and his book became a bestseller. Mm. It went through many different editions. It was translated into other languages, other European mm. languages. Um, and he became, you know, quite a well-known mm. campaigner mm. in at that time. 
Um, and as I said, that campaign was one of the biggest in Britain's history. It involved working people for the first time, women, mm -hmm. uh, people, you know, boycotted sugar, stopped taking sugar in their tea and their coffee, signed oh. petitions. <laughs> yeah. I went through a strange period where, is it Tate and Lau, the, the company's mm -hmm. called? Yeah. I went through a strange period, I think around secondary school time where, I, I mean, I always knew about the, the sugar plantations and the cotton picking and so forth, but I went through a period where some someone enforced the idea back into me and I went through a strange period where I didn't want to touch sugar again because of what it was associated with. But then I, I, I took a step back and realised that everything around you involves the, the slave trade and involves the, the work and the labour of the slaves. So h how do we then find that space where you're able to then coexist in a space that, con that consists of so much suffering? Well, I think the thing is to, uh, you know, take action just mm. as people did in the, the 18th century. Um, you know, you're right, the whole society and political mm -hmm. and economic system we live in is in some ways a product of that time. Mm. You know, the banking system, the insurance system, the national yeah. debt, all the major institutions, mm -hmm. they all came out of yeah. slavery and colonialism. But, um, and that those kind of systems of exploitation and oppressing people, they still continue. Um, mm. You know, African countries, for example, are still being exploited by the big financial institutions and mm. big monopoly companies and so on. So um, just as, you know, people in Britain and other countries also, you know, still suffering um political and economic problems that people faced or similar problems to the ones people faced in those days. So mm. the thing is to take action, to do something about it yeah. or to find ways of doing something about yeah. it. Uh, it's, so uh, is that action, does that involve like Pan-Africanism? What, what, what's, the, what's the relationship between Pan-Africanism and um, taking action? Uh, well, Pan-Africanism is the name that was given to the movement and the idea that Africans should get together. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, Africans from the continent, Africans from the diaspora, mm -hmm. um, should get together to address the problems that they had mm -hmm. in common. Mm -hmm. um, and in other words, that the, the liberation of Africa, the liberation mm -hmm. of Africans globally could be impacted by Africans getting together, yeah. speaking for themselves, acting together, um, campaigning together. Um, and that, you know, first took place in the period of Equano because he mm. was involved with a group of Africans who called themselves the Sons of Africa, mm -hmm. who wrote letters to politicians who said that they spoke to, they spoke on behalf of Africans. So that's an early form of Pan-Africanism. It wasn't mm. called Pan-Africanism in that period. Yeah. But we can find lots of other examples. And, mm. and many of them started because Africans had been taken away from the African continent. Mm. They were forced together in places like Britain or the US or the Caribbean. And obviously they were enslaved or they were compatriots were enslaved mm -hmm. or were discriminated against, were subject to racism, were subject to racist violence. Mm. And they decided they needed to get together and try and do something about it. Yeah. So so all of that, all of that is um, a form of Pan-Africanism, we can yeah. say. So, I mean, that, that, that's mobilization in a sense, and, and, I, and I, I understand the, the power behind mobilization. Um, you, you made a you made a powerful statement in one of your um, talks. I've been consuming a lot of your content recently. And um, I think you said we're not in a position of decision-making and that's mm -hmm. one of the key issues. So there's mobilisation and then there's being a position of power-making. Yeah. How, how, how can those two coincide in order to put, put um, Africans in a better position? Because you can mobilise but still not be in a position of power. You can protest but still yeah. not be in a 
position yeah. to make change happen. And that's, you know, one of the big problems that we face now. I mean, sometimes people have become decision makers by, you know, taking power. Mm. So mm -hmm. if we go back to the 18th century, mm. um, we know that those people who were enslaved in the Caribbean island of Haiti, mm. um, where the life expectancy of an enslaved person was you know, about seven years. Oh, wow. They decided, okay, we we refuse to accept this condition anymore. Mm. And, you know, half a million of them brought from the different parts of Africa. Yeah. They rose up. Mm -hmm. They overthrew the slave system. Mm -hmm. They defeated the armies of, it was a French colony, they defeated mm -hmm. the French army. The British and the Spanish army intervened. They defeated mm -hmm. the British and the Spanish as well. Yeah, wow. They and they set up their own republic, mm -hmm. declared their independence. Um, so that's a very unusual example of empowerment because mm. there are no other examples of successful slave revolutions in history. Yeah, but that is a very important one, and it gave um, inspiration to a lot of other. Africans or people of African descent mm -hmm. all over the world. But so it, it shows what can be done. But mm. you could say today, yeah, we people in general, not just Africans, but very often people all over the world face similar challenges. Yeah. You know, how do you actually become a decision maker in the society in which you live? Mm. Uh, if you're in Ghana, how do you become a decision maker? If you're in Britain, Mm. How do you become a decision maker? If you're in the US under Trump, how do you become a decision maker? Yeah. So that's really the great problem of the 20th century, that people have to work out how to do it. Yeah. Um, again, it's kind of based around, how shall I put it? Let's, let's, if we use an example, if we use Ghana as an example. Mm -hmm. So in the colonial period, uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah yeah. and others, they said to the people, okay, we need to get together, we need to campaign, we need to protest, we need to demand that, we need to demand our independence from Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and by, as you said, mobilizing people, organizing people, they were able to achieve that independence. They, in other words, they forced the British colonial authorities to vacate Ghana yeah. so that, okay, it's governed by Ghanaians. And Nkrumah famously said, seek ye first the political kingdom mm -hmm. and all else will be rendered unto you. In other words... It's a quote from the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's like, yeah. It's a, anyway, so in mm -hmm. other words, if you, you seize this political kingdom, then everything, all other doors will be opened. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, the political kingdom which they seized was the kind of colonial kingdom in a way, or to, yeah. to put it another way, it was the kind of political system which exists in Britain and yeah. other countries where most people don't have decision-making power. Mm. So the problem exists, whether in Ghana or in Britain, how can the majority of people become the decision-makers? So it's, it is a question for Pan-Africanists, but it's also a question for everybody else in the world. Mm. Um, that we still have political systems which were initially begun hundreds of years ago when the rulers claimed that they were the only intelligent ones who could rule. Yeah. People didn't even have the votes and so on and so forth. Mm. And Whereas now we're in the 21st century. We're mm. all educated. We're literate. Yeah. So but really we need, we need new political systems. Yeah. But... People will again will have to organize and fight and find ways of empowering themselves to become mm. decision makers. But then there's, there's that tricky element for so let's say the let's say the Africans in the diaspora. There's that tricky element that the culture that they've been brought up in is completely different from that of the culture back in Africa. So how, how does that gap even get bridged? Or where does where where does the understanding come from? You know, where does the cohesion come from? Well, really? the understanding comes through uh, discussion, through organizing. Mm -hmm. um, and it it depends what people are 
organizing for, discussing like what what problems they're trying to solve. Mm. Um, because you know you can say people in the diaspora mm. are maybe concerned. They may be connected with Nigeria. They may can be connected mm. with Ghana. They may be connected with Jamaica. They may be mm-hmm. connected with all kinds of different places, mm. and they're also connected with Britain or the U.S. or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, you could say that people people also have to be concerned about the countries in which they live. Mm. Um, in other words, Pan Africanism doesn't just mean being concerned about. Africa, Pan-Africanism also means being concerned with the country in which you live, maybe Britain, maybe France, maybe the US, knowing that if you are involved in struggling for change in, let's say, Britain, Mm. when, if and when that change occurs in Britain, it will also have a major impact in Africa. Yeah. Because... You know, if one looks at many of the problems confronting Africa today, they're caused by external factors. Mm-hmm. They're, co- they're concerned by the IMF. They're concerned mm-hmm. by the World Bank. Mm-hmm. They're concerned by the big multinational yeah. companies that originate in Britain, in France, in Europe, mm-hmm. in the US, nowadays also in China and elsewhere. So you could say taking action is a kind of, gl- it's a kind of global question to mm-hmm. be resolved. Um, how can you know the people of the world turn things around, mm. become the decision makers? A long time ago, just to give a, a, a kind of analogy, yeah. I was in Cuba, and I heard a speech by Fidel Castro. Amazing. So Fidel. So you saw the man himself. I saw the man. You've seen some amazing I people. I heard him. I mean, before we could, before you continue, because we were talking just before this, and you're talking about um, watching Bob Marley live, which kind of blew my mind because he's my idol, and it's like you've well, seen some amazing people. In your well, time. you only have to ask because I'm older than you, so that's the only reason. I was I was <laughs> yeah. around in you know '76 or oh, whenever it was last century. Yeah. But yeah, I've seen Bob Marley, and I've seen Fidel Castro. Wow. Anyway, so Fidel gave this speech. So I'm gonna cut it short where he said he said the world is like a ship Mm -hmm. and on the ship there are a handful of first class cabins where the passengers have you know every mod con Mm -hmm. every luxury every whatever modern convenience but he said the majority of people on this ship don't inhabit these first class cabins they live below decks mm. in conditions which are you know reminiscent of slavery and mm. traffic human trafficking across the atlantic and so on he said unless those people who are below decks rise up and mm. take over the helm of the ship mm. it will hit an iceberg and be destroyed wow. so that is an analogy about the world we live in Mm-hmm. Now, the world we live in is, is in chaos. Every day we're hearing about some new crisis. Mm. We're hearing about global warming. We're mm. hearing about environmental problems. Yeah. Um, and the reason for those is because it's the way the world is run at the moment and the kind of systems which operate. Mm. So unless those of us who are most affected by these things whether in whatever country we live, mm. unless we take over the, the helm, in other words, unless we become decision makers, mm. that chaos and that crisis will, it's going to continue. will continue. So mm. we have to find ways of doing it. How do we empower ourselves? Mm. How do we become decision makers? You know, so that we decide, um, you know, we were talking on the way here, what kind of transport system we have yeah we're going to have you know everything polluted or are we going to have a different system Mm. um you know what kind of education we have what kind of health system we have Mm. is it a system which is provided for the benefit of everybody or is it a system which makes money for the big pharmaceutical companies and so on so what kind of world we live in in a way depends on on us, mm-hmm. on us being 
like those half a million Africans in Haiti in 1791 and deciding we're not going to put up with this anymore, we're going to do something about it. The difficulty, of course, is that the powers that be tell us that there's not, you can't do anything. Mm. There's no alternative. This is the best possible system. Mm. And we, the politicians, we know better than you know. Yeah. Leave it to Prime Minister Johnson. <laughs> Leave it to President Trump. Yeah. Everything will be fine. Yeah. But our, our experience tells us that that's not true. We're going to hear an iceberg. We, exactly, yeah. unless we take action. Yeah. So we have to find how to take that action and that involves mobilization, it involves protesting, it involves, but it also involves finding ways to, to empower ourselves, mm. um, you know, to get together to say, yeah, actually we are going to be the decision makers. We don't want to leave it in the hands of Johnson or Trump or yeah. Buhari or whoever. Yeah. But in a democracy, most people will say we are the decision makers because we choose our leaders. Yeah, but... Yeah, but but we, we're not in a democracy. Mm. Who told us we were in a democracy? If we were in a democracy, we would decide everything. That's true. But in terms of voting our leaders into power, like, aren't we in charge of that? Well, even that, you could say we're not really in charge of mm. because there are usually two or three major parties yeah. that are financed by various interests mm-hmm. that have the media at their disposal. Mm. Um, and don't really provide an alternative to the status quo. Mm-hmm. So it's like me saying to you, okay, I'm going to execute you tomorrow. Mm. Would you like to be shot or would you like <laughs> yeah. to be hanged? <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. So you're going to say, mm, uh, let me think about that. Which one's going to be quick and less painful? <laughs> what you, now when you think about it long enough, you're going to say, mm. neither. Mm. So that's what we have to say. Neither of these parties or their system really allows us to be the decision makers mm. because we don't decide about the health system we don't provide a, mm-hmm. decide about the education system we don't decide about the transport system we yeah. don't decide whether we go to war mm-hmm. or not which is an important one yeah and that is the same in ghana in nigeria in the u.s mm. in wherever you go yeah. you know and I, I think one of the most important parts of that is as well is, I mean, empowering ourselves involves education and really understanding what's happening. Because for many, many years, I did not have a clue why I was voting for who I was voting for. I did not understand any of the manifestos. Mm-hmm. I wasn't reading into any of the policies mm-hmm. of any of the politicians. Mm-hmm. I was either voting on the whim or I was voting because that's who my family votes for, whether it's good for us or not. And that's why mm-hmm. I'm constantly encouraging people to do your own due diligence, like read up on it, understand what benefits you, your people, your future. Mm-hmm and what benefits your community as a whole so that's really important yeah but the, the, the in a way the system encourages that um, what can you say that that lack of knowledge mm. it doesn't educate its electorate yeah um, so I mean I guess like brexit is a obvious example mm. you know you're you're pushed to take a side yeah you're pushed to say yes. I want, to, I want to leave. I want to stay, yeah. but the information isn't really there, mm. and what information is provided is very often not not mm, accurate yeah. at all. So yeah. you're then forced to. First of all, they, they, there's a division is created. Mm-hmm. Everybody's at each other's throats about whether they're leavers yeah. or remainers. You're only given two choices here again. But yeah. then the actual problems again of really being the decision makers about again what kind of economy we have what kind of political system we have Mm. whether we remain or whether we leave the political system isn't going to change Mm. the economic system isn't going to change our ability to make decisions about all the things that affect us that's not going to change Mm -hmm. so people are not asked a question about that or just to decide about that Mm. they're there an artificial um, situation is created. Yeah. And elections are a bit like that. You 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 know, we're kind of used like sort of voting cattle. We're yeah. sort of pushed. And our emotions are constantly dragged you're back pushed, and forth. Yeah. Your the newspaper tells you this party is like this, this mm. party is like mm-hmm. this, put a cross on this piece of paper here and so on. Yeah. But then you could argue if we are 
intelligent enough or mm. trusted enough or whatever to put a cross on a piece of paper. Why can't we make decisions about everything? Yeah. Why can't we... Would you say that's, this, a, that's the ideal um, political system to have where the people make decisions about yeah, everything? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, really. I think so. Yeah. Um, because it's the majority of people who create everything in society, mm. which create the wealth, uh, who work, who... Mm. And so those people who work and who create everything should be able to say what happens to yeah. what they create. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever the, um, the national wealth is, mm -hmm. it should be the people who decide, as I said, whether they want to invest it in education, whether they want to invest it in health, mm -hmm. um, that should be a that should be that's democracy. Mm. Democracy is government by the people of the people for the for people. The people. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah, definitely we, not. We, um, we have a system which generally favours mm -hmm. the most wealthy sections of society. Yeah, is that human greed though? Because it's, it's such a strange thing. It's just power and influence. I think it's power and a particular kind of political and economic system. Mm which, you know, as you know, all the figures show the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, mm -hmm. whether here or whether in Africa. That's mm -hmm. what this particular kind of economic system produces. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's all, but it's also a system that leads to environmental crisis, that leads to economic crisis, that leads to unemployment, that leads to um, political crisis, leads to war, leads yeah. to... So... It's not a system which is a benefit to the majority of people. Mm. Um, you know, if we go to Africa, Nigeria is Africa's biggest economy. Yeah. Does that mean that Nigerians are all enjoying life? No. <laughs> Most yeah. Nigerians are living under um, less than $2 a day. Yeah. No electricity, yeah. no yeah. running water, no... Yeah. How, how is that political system and economic system benefiting... Mm. The majority of people yeah it's, it's interesting you said that actually because um I, I was listening to a talk recently and the gentleman said that one one of the issues within he was talking about the american black community and he said one of the issues within the american black community is that they always totally vicariously through the few that are up there mm -hmm. so instead of there being an equal spread across the board they just living through the few because i think the statistics was like um like I think 1% of the population within the black community um, owned about, I think, 75 to 80% of the wealth, whilst in, in the white community, it was, it, was, it was less than that. So there's only a tiny few people that have, and then the rest have nothing. Yeah. But then they're totally vicariously through them. And in doing so, you kind of numb the, the, all the others underneath, and they, they're living through others when they have nothing at home. But sure. they're happy because they have representation. But representation doesn't mean that it's an equal spread across the board. Yeah, and I mean, that's generally the case that, you know, the, the, the wealth is owned by, you know, 1% or whatever. 90% yeah. of the wealth mm. is owned by 1% and so on in society. Mm. And, and you're right. Those that are the wealthiest also have the media at their disposal yeah. of various kinds, along with their algorithms, which I'm sure yeah. they develop <laughs> as well. So yeah. they're constantly putting out... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this message yeah. that, yeah, as you say, you can enjoy, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, the Kardashians or yeah. the, or yeah. Kanye West or who, anyway, whoever, whoever, mm -hmm. that that somehow this is, you know, mm -hmm. this person represents you yeah. or Obama represents you. Well, mm -hmm. Obama doesn't represent the majority yeah. of people and never never did. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's people know from their own experience that. The world isn't like this. Life isn't like this. But there's constant yeah. propaganda, you could say, that forget about your experience. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is what the world is yeah. is this like. This is the potential. This is what you could potentially have. And, yeah, if you yeah. work, you yeah. know, you work hard enough, and you know, yeah. you can, you know, it's this is a a system where everybody can rise to the top. Mm. But it isn't. No, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not possible. Yeah, it's, it's not possible. It's not possible. definitely a tricky one. And the, the few that rise to the top, you know, one has to think about essentially how is wealth created? Who creates wealth? Mm. And, you know, in this society, um, there's a lot of confusion about how, who are the wealth creators. Mm. Um, 
and the, the wealth creators essentially are those who work, whether they work in this country or they work in other countries. Everything which is produced mm. is produced by human beings. Mm -hmm. So that, that wealth is based on people creating things. It's not created by, you know, somebody sitting in front of a computer gambling <laughs> where the currency is going up or down or where the stocks mm. and shares going up and down. Yeah. That wealth is based on somebody somewhere having created, yeah. producing having something. to produce yeah, something, exactly. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the wealth producers, that's to say the millions of people who work, mm. don't own what they produce. Mm. Somebody else owns it. Rather like slavery, where mm. as an enslaved person you work, you produce cotton, you produce sugar, but you don't own it. So yeah. Somebody else owns it. It's like cocoa in Ghana. So we, we produce cocoa and then it gets shipped abroad and make the chocolate and then we buy it back at Snickers. Yeah. At like quadruple the price or, I mean, a hundred times the price. I mean, if it's not thousands, <laughs> what the original value of the cocoa was. Yeah. That's a that's a very good example. Mm. Or in Nigeria, we could, we argue Nigeria produces oil, but mm. um, people in Nigeria can't afford kerosene, can't afford petrol, yeah. can't afford, you know, um, and don't get paid for what they produce. Mm. There's a handful of millionaires and billionaires who are benefiting from this, mm. this oil wealth and not the majority of people in the country. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so uh, as we were coming here, you were, this, you were talking about your new book which you're working on, which is about the, the history of the, the diaspora in, in Britain. Um, I, it's something that I haven't really looked into. Can you just give me a brief history about the... I know you're, you're just in the process of writing the book, so everything's not really put together, but I just wanted to understand a bit more about uh, the British history and the British experience. Um... Well, Africans have been in Britain for mm. um, at least 2,000 years, mm. certainly from Roman times mm -hmm. and prob probably even before Roman times. Oh, wow. So, Is there evidence of prior to Roman times? And how, how do... Well, I mean, even the latest, the latest evidence is very interesting. Mm. Um, you may have seen it about Cheddar Man. Oh yeah, I saw Cheddar Man. Yeah. So Cheddar really Man is yeah. like ten thousand yeah. years ago or more. Mm. Um, so it's not to say that Cheddar Man mm. came from Africa, but Cheddar Man's ancestors came from Africa. So Cheddar mm. Man, up until you know the last couple of years, Cheddar Man was always presented as somebody with blonde hair and blue eyes. Yeah. So now Cheddar Man may have had blue eyes, but mm. he had dark brown skin yeah um anyway he looked very very different from the way he'd been presented in the past mm -hmm. and so on so it's quite likely that some other early britons you know, if you like you could say that cheddar man was a a person of color or mm -hmm. a black person uh, to use a kind of modern language mm -hmm. so that you know the the ancestors of um the, the English come from this this origin. So yeah, certainly if we go back to Roman times, mm -hmm. um, there was some Roman there was even a Roman emperor mm. called Septimius Severus, who came from Libya, who was of kind of Berber origin, mm. or say Berber and Roman origin. And he was here in the um, he was here in like the third century. Um, he died in York, and he brought with him many African soldiers, North African soldiers. Yeah. They've now found the skeletal remains of an African woman who died in York. They've, She's kind of been nicknamed the Ivory Bangle Lady because she had an ivory <laughs> bangle. Yeah. They've done a reconstruction of her. Again, they think they, she mm. was an Af African woman. Mm. You know, and now they can do all these archaeological yeah. things the based 3D. on teeth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, so based on, or based on DNA, but also mm. based on um, kind of tooth enamel mm. so they can work out what kind of water people drank as a yeah. child where they came yeah. from and so on so anyway there's several discoveries of skeletons of people who were clearly african 
mm. in that period. Um, and then in the next few centuries, we know that, um, again, probably not large numbers, small numbers of people came from Africa um, in the next few centuries. In the medieval period also, again, mm. a few skeletons have been found. So because only a few skeletons have been found, one doesn't know how many, you know, how many people actually came oh, to Britain yeah. during that period or how they came. Mm. But of course, this is a period, if we go from about 700 to 1500, this is a period when, uh, of Muslim Spain, where people from North Africa mm. invaded, conquered, lived in Spain and Portugal. Mm. So it's possible that some people may have come from Spain or from Portugal during that time. Mm. There are other, um, there are some um, evidence that maybe people brought Africans back or Africans came during the period of the mm. Crusades. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so there are, um, there are reports of Saracen bowmen mm. Uh, and various people and Saracen was generally a a term that could be applied to Muslims and mm. also North Africans and then there's a couple, one example of a person who was um, I think his name was Bartholomew if I remember rightly mm. who was actually an enslaved person this is like in the I think, I think from memory 13th century oh, wow. mm. um, who was a, it was described as an Ethiopian mm meaning probably not somebody from the modern country of Ethiopia yeah. but a black person black from person, Africa yeah. um, and he anyway uh, the, the king was asking questions about this person mm. and that he should be apprehended that he'd run away and mm. so that's in the very very early period so then from about 1500 onwards so Tudor period the time of Elizabeth I we know that there were more Africans here. Um, there were African musicians. There were African women. Mm. There was a, a diver who was African. A diver? Um, diver, yeah. yeah. He was um, involved in the salvage of the Mary Rose, which okay, was the yeah. flagship of mm. Henry VIII. Uh, and he's recorded in various official records. Mm. Um, so there were people like that. We know there were Africans at the court yeah. of Elizabeth, the, the Scottish court. There were African men, women, and children. Mm. Um, and these would have been, and there were people living in other towns and cities up and down the country. Mm. So probably hundreds of people. Whether, again, they may have come from Spain and Portugal, most likely um, but we also know some Africans came from what is today Ghana were brought mm -hmm. in the middle of the 16th century at that time English merchants were making contact with Africa and beginning um, to engage in trade with Africa mm -hmm. so people were probably brought back to maybe learn the language or to train as interpreters mm -hmm. or whatever and then from that period also, there's also the beginnings of some, um, one or a few people may be kidnapped and enslaved, but mm. the vast majority of people who were here then would have been free people. Yeah. Um, so this was before it was turned into an economical yes, move. Yeah. Yeah. And then from the, and that, that's also, so then when we go into the 17th century, um, Britain begins to get more and more involved in the whole human trafficking of Africans, mm -hmm. especially after about 1660, when Britain acquired colonies in the Caribbean, so mm -hmm. places like Barbados, St. Kitts, mm -hmm. Jamaica. Um, and then by that time, uh, some Africans were being transported to the Caribbean, some being brought here as maybe as servants or people who were enslaved. Mm -hmm. um, so in the 17th century, and then the 18th century, by the 18th century, we find there were thousands of Africans here, yeah. maybe as many as 10,000. Wow. Some 
servants, some <laughs> enslaved people, some free people, some people being educated here, African mm. rulers sending their sons to be educated. So nepotism was still working during those days. Mm -hmm. yeah. People who were here as, um, uh, you know, they're, they're examples of African musicians, mm. Africans in the army, Africans in the navy, uh, people like Equiano we spoke of yeah. earlier who worked as a hairdresser um, Ignatius Sancho was a grocer mm. African a almost anything you can think of mm. um, in terms of occupation and profession in that period Africans were in engaged in it then in the 19th century again um Africans here, Africans who came directly from the continent, mm -hmm. Africans who came from the Caribbean, Africans who came from North America, in a whole variety of occupations. Some, mm. there were African missionaries, the African circus owners, mm. the African circus performers, the African boxers, there are African political activists, wow. there are, um, you know, people like. Mary Seacole, who came from Jamaica, who was a, a nurse, a doctress. Mm. Um, so, and then we go to the African composers like Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Mm. Um, and then when we come to the 20th century, Africans who came here to study, um, Africans who were here as workers, who mm. were seafarers, who um, lived in communities in Liverpool, in Bristol, in Cardiff, in London, in Glasgow, in South Shields and so on. Uh, people who started to organise to campaign against colonial rule in Africa or the yeah. Caribbean. Um, anyway, that brings... <laughs> that's, Anyway, it's difficult it's, to present it's a, it's a 2,000 <laughs> years of history of in history, 10 yeah. minutes. But yeah. So there's a very, very long history. Um, people engaged in all sorts of different occupations. Mm. You know, people living in towns and cities. All over. Uh, all over the country yeah. for hundreds of years. Oh, wow, it's amazing. It's a nice, well, it's a brief history of, um, but when your book does come out, it's going to be a bit more in detail in relation It'll to... It'll be very much in detail. <laughs> yeah. Very uh, much in detail. Um, c coming back to the modern day, what is the, what's the, mil uh, like, so for millennials, for instance, what's been their involvement in the Pan-African movement? Have you seen any, um, any influx in millennials getting involved in the Pan-African movement? Uh, the reason why I ask, I'll give you a bit of backdrop. So the reason why I ask is, um, within my circle of friends, we've never discussed it. And, and I, mean, I, mean, I mean a lot of groups whereby discussions are now being had, we're reaching a certain age where we're, where we're exploring stuff, and that's the reason why I'm trying to find out more about the, the, the Pan-African movement and the history of Africans within um, the UK. But I always feel like whenever I have a conversation regarding Pan-Africanism, it's always from the, the, the previous generations. So millennials don't seem to be too in tune. Is, it, is, is there a disparity there, or is it something that...? I think it's more difficult now. Pan-Africanism was, mm. you know, particularly a feature of the 20th century. Yeah. And it particularly manifested itself mm -hmm. um, in relation to, you know, the anti-colonial struggle. Mm. the independence of African countries um, and probably people feel now particularly since 1994 the end of apartheid that you know there's nothing there are no major problems left to deal with been everything's been resolved yeah. mm -hmm. um, but in fact many problems remain I mean even if we just look at, at Britain um there are problems related to racism. There are problems related to um, deportation, for example. Mm. Um, there are problems related to the way that Africans are, Africa and Africans are presented in the media. Yeah. There are issues related to um, how Africa and African history is presented in schools and universities and so on. Because yeah, it's taught from slavery and that's the... Yeah. It's taught from a very Eurocentric mm -hmm. position. So to give you an example, I have a 
uh, I'm involved with a young historians project which is made up of young people of African and Caribbean heritage. Mm -hmm. So you could say that's a kind of pan-African organization. It doesn't call itself a pan-African organization. Mm -hmm. It doesn't promote mm -hmm. pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. whatever that is in inverted commas, but it's drawn from people from mm -hmm. Africa and the diaspora who are joining together to deal with a particular problem, which is that young people of African and Caribbean heritage are not really engaging with history, yeah. are not studying history, are not writing history, yeah. um, and are maybe put off history because it's presented from a very Eurocentric perspective. Yeah. So these young people are focusing on the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain, yeah. are telling these stories for themselves, are writing for themselves, are producing films, mm. podcasts, about the history of African and Caribbean people in Britain. Um, for all those who want to uh, understand it, and so that, if you like, other young people won't be disengaged, won't be put off, won't mm. just think that history is about, you know, white men of property. Yeah. I will realize that history it should be and is about everybody. Mm -hmm. So you could say that's a kind of pan-African endeavor. Yeah, there's always been a strange relationship between millennials as such and um, and, and Africa. So 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 the diaspora, the millennials within the diaspora in Africa. Because I mean, even though I was born in Ghana, I left Ghana at an early age. I left Ghana at the age of three. So everything I learned about Africa from the age of three up until the first time I returned to Ghana was 18 before I started going, going back to Africa more regularly mm -hmm. was, um, was kids with their ribs showing and flies on their noses. Mm -hmm. So I, we always get this um, preconceived notion that Africa is this poverty stricken place and you're happy, you should be happy to be here mm -hmm. and this is your history and this is your home because mm -hmm. if you go back there, there's nothing there for you. Mm -hmm. So there's always been this weird relationship. But what, what I'm finding more recently, um, especially, I don't know about other communities, but in my circle, particularly with the Nigerians and Ghanaians, when we started going back more regularly, we realized that the there is the, the, there might be a big um, disparity, there might be a big gap between the rich and the poor and the have and the have nots, but those that have there is there is a lot of similarities between us and them mm -hmm. in terms of maybe like lifestyle mm -hmm. and accessibility to certain things, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot to have access to those things, but there are there. But sometimes we're under the preconceived notion that when you go there, there's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. So more people tend to go back more regularly now. And they, they, a, a few friends of mine that I know directly are going back and setting up businesses and myself going back there and setting up projects and so forth. So it's, it's, it's interesting to go back and really look into your history and look into where you come from instead of having this Eurocentric view of it. I think those links are there. My experience of talking to, with young people um, especially those who originate or their parents originate from the continent mm. is as you say increasingly people are going back mm. they want to work or settle in Africa mm. I think that the issue is um, you could say from the kind of pan-Africanist mm. perspective is not just an issue of going back but it's a question of what you do when you're there Either. because mm. as you say um, for most people in Africa, that there are still very, very major problems, mm -hmm. economic problems, political problems, and so on. So the question then is, those who have had, we can say like the benefit maybe of mm. growing up outside, what are they taking back to address those problems? So mm. not just going back to... Taken as well. <laughs> not just yeah. going back to make money or yeah. to be personally... Yeah joining the elite mm. but like we used to say each one teach one what are yeah. they doing to help those who um, are not so well off what are they mm. doing to address the problems of yeah. the, these countries that that's really the kind of um, pan-africanist perspective because mm. if you look in the past you know people like Nkrumah you know he went to the US he studied in the US mm. he came to Britain he studied here but he didn't say, okay, well, I'm just going to go back and get a good job. And No, mm. he went back and said, you know, my country must be liberated. Mm. And so the, the kind of tradition is that those who were here, as much as, or certainly some of them, said, okay, what 
can we do to assist in the liberation of others? Mm. Um, and also, what can we do to address the problems that we face in Britain? Because, you know, in Nkrumah's time or whatever, whenever we go back into history, there were these problems of racism, there were problems of discrimination, there mm. were problems of inequalities and so on. And those who were here from, from Africa very often tried to address those problems. Mm. Tried to, you know, we go back to the time of the West African Students' Union. That's formed in 1925. Mm. So they were concerned about, yes, the way Africa is represented. Mm -hmm. um, why is Africa presented in this negative way? Mm. In their day, it was a problem that um, there were exhibitions at Wembley uh, presenting Africans in, you know... Um, mud huts yeah. with live Africans. Wow. So they took it up. Mm. They complained. They protested to the press. They protested to the government. Mm. They didn't say, oh, well, we're, you know, training as barristers and doctors. We're okay. Yeah, we're going to leave those. They as actually well. took up mm. these points because they realized that they were affected by these things. Yeah. Um, that when they went to get somewhere to live, People didn't say, "Oh, are you a wealthy African?" Mm. They just said, "Oh, you're a nigger." Yeah, and we're not yeah. gonna, we're not gonna give you a hotel room, or yeah. we're not gonna, you know. So that image has already been painted, and you've allowed it because you had your own selfish. Yeah. Needs so needs. you know, mm. this is something for millennials and others that they should also be taking up these things. Mm. I think, you know, we have to have the thing about history is that history is about change really mm. is about how human beings change things and we have to understand that we are the change makers mm. um, like we used to say we are our own liberators mm -hmm. so if there's a problem that we're confronted with we have to do something about it 100%. and in the past people had this spirit that okay I'm not just doing it for you know for Ghana I'm not just I'm doing it because it's something which affects mm. all Africans or all people of African heritage mm. and if all people of African heritage work together then we can make some change we can make we can make some progress we can do something positive yeah. um, and I think you know that is the case you know if we look at um to say the history of Ghana, all kinds of people went to Ghana mm -hmm. to help in that struggle. People from, you know, George Padmore was Trinidadian, yeah. he went. People came from US, people came from other places, people went from Britain to assist in that struggle. And it's that kind of spirit, you could say, which um, is still important because yeah. the, there are still those problems which confront people um, and what is needed is this unity, mm. this idea of unity, this idea of, um, you know, we're all, we have common interests, we have common concerns. If we work together, you know, like, as you say, if, if um, you have one stick, it can be easily broken. Yeah, if you have definitely. 20 sticks, yeah. it's, it's impossible to break. To break. Yeah. So that, that conception of things, that uh, people should unite in unity is strength, mm is I think important because um, it's, definitely, it's not just a question of you know being rich and living well but yeah. living in a, a world which is well yeah you know it's definitely and I think as a society as well we, we always owe it to each other to help the downtrodden because I mean yeah we live in a free society with free rule where you're able well to an extent where you're able to achieve but then there's, there's those but we don't just, live in a free society that's the <laughs> <a> problem <laughs> yeah we, there's, so what, what I was going to say there's something interesting in regards to what we were just discussing so um, I, I don't know where I saw this from but it's just, it was a it, it was in relation to a group of slaves that were released from the states and they, went, they were sent back to um, whatever country that they were in what's the word they use because I want to start using that word it's not traded from but kidnapped it's a kidnapped, kidnapped because, from yeah so they, so they returned back to the country trafficked from trafficked from that's the word yeah I'm going to start using that from now so, so they returned back to the country that they were trafficked from and in relation to what we were just discussing about Africans going back the millennials and setting up businesses and trying to pull money what these um, freed slaves did is they went back and enslaved 
um, they, the people from the countries that they would just be released back into mm. and they were basically repeating the actions of their slave masters so it's quite <laughs> it's, it's interesting uh, parallel but it's, it's, it kind of it's a similar act as in like going back and wanting to now take from your homeland in, in the assumption that you're doing something instead of going with a purpose to create yeah. genuine change yeah. yeah I mean again you know we have to understand um, that these yeah, you, you could just say from a kind of moral point of view that, mm. you know, not to use a, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, then, mm. um, you know, we don't want a world in which the only way people can get on is by exploiting others yeah. um, or press, pressing others. We want a world, the, the world is, there's enough wealth in the world for everybody to live a reasonable existence, but... Mm the way the system operates at the moment, that isn't possible. Mm. Um, as, you, as you said, 1% can live well, or as Fidel said, 1% can live well in first class cabins. Mm. The majority of people are below the decks. And it's those majority of people below the decks that allow the 1% to live well. 1% mm. don't live well because they're intelligent mm. or because they've been blessed. Mm. They live well because they're living from the wealth which yeah. the 99 percent have created mm -hmm. so that can't be right how mm -hmm. can that be right yeah um so it's that that has to be you know dealt with and um you know that there, there has to be a, a conception of um of serving you know i think back in the day when i was young you know you'd go to university, you'd get educated. Mm. But in order to do what? Not in order to live well and make a lot of money, but to give back, yeah. to contribute, to serve other people, um, to find ways of, you know, as you say, helping others. Mm. Um, and I think that's important. I think that most people want to, most people don't want to live in a society where you don't want to cross over the road there because they're all these poor people, mm. because they're these open sewers, because they're people begging, mm. uh, because if you go there, you're going to get robbed. Mm. Most people don't want to live behind a high wall yeah. because they want to keep out all the poor people. People want to live in a society which everybody has a reasonable standard of living, mm. um, where you only get electricity if you've got a generator. No. Yeah, that's ridiculous. You only have water if you've got a borehole. Yeah. No. <laughs> and it seems like the basis of even achieving that isn't that far-fetched either. So w what's the requirements for a human to live in, in, in fairly decent? I think what's required is to have a different economic and political system which is, doesn't just benefit the 1% or 2%. Mm. You know, a political and economic system which everybody is a decision-maker, um, you know, everybody decides, okay, this is the national wealth. Mm -hmm. These are the most important things for the majority of people. Electricity, water, health, education, mm -hmm. sewage, or whatever it is. These are the important things. Yeah. Not so that one person can have 12 cars and 20 houses. That's, mm -hmm. Why should they? Mm -hmm. So, But unfortunately, the, the system at the moment benefits the person who has the 12 houses and the... 20 cars mm. and they do everything they can to hang on to that system or generally speaking and that the the 99 percent who don't have that have to get together and find ways of changing things yeah. you know yeah. whether in ghana or whether in britain or whether in the u.s or whether nigeria or in south yeah. africa it's basically the same system the same problem mm. um, and it creates all these other difficulties because everything is geared to making money. So it ruins the environment. You know, it's spiritually devastating. You know, you turn on the television, there's complete rubbish. Mm. Um, you know, people are uneducated. Even in Britain, Britain is, what, the world's, whatever, fifth most prosperous country. People mm. are on the streets begging. People yeah. are homeless. People are going to food banks. Yeah, but, but, uh, but some would argue that even if, so let's say for instance, even if there was some sort of fair distribution, there will still always be those who would, who would kind of push through that barrier. Do you see what I mean? So the, 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 yeah, there will still be, but push through the barrier to do what? Like e economically. So if if 
if so let, let's say because there always has to be a trade system wouldn't it be so that there will always be sales or trade of goods in order for mm -hmm. in order for a society to function so there'll mm -hmm. still be those people that will figure out ways around it yeah but why why, why would you see it's it's like um it depends what kind of system you have mm. if you have a system which is um geared to serving the interests of the majority mm. if you let's say you um let's say that you invent something mm -hmm. which um you know enables us to i don't know whatever mm enables us to, to Manchester in 30 seconds well whatever yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the question is um, should you become a billionaire because you invented it or should you be, um, should it be used for the benefit of mm. society so uh, under yeah. this system when you invent that thing mm. uh, probably somebody will come along patent it and then hide it mm. probably they will they'll probably hide it because um, it would stop lots of other people making money from producing cars or mm. producing whatever, or producing planes or producing whatever. They say, no, we don't want that invention. We'll, we'll, mm. we'll hide it. So the, the, the system doesn't even use the, 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 the technology and the advances it has for the benefit of everybody. Yeah. It uses them, it gears them to, is it going to make money mm. for the powers that be? So that, that's not a, a useful way of running things. You want a system, okay, yes, you might invent something, okay, mm. fine. We might, uh, you know, give you a, a higher salary or whatever. But it doesn't mean that as a consequence of that, which, you, which has probably been produced by lots of other people working and mm. contributing and so on, it, it's something which should be utilized for the mm. benefit of everybody. Um, it, 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 it doesn't mean you sh you do, you're not going to have any difference in terms of, you know, what people get paid and so on. Yeah. But if you look at the differentials now, oh, between, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. Yeah. So it's you ridiculous. want a system where they're not, mm. whatever they are, five hundred to one. Mm. Maybe they're two to one. Mm. Maybe yeah, they're three think, to one. Because I think without a certain element of reward, human beings would. I think we we we, we strive to invent things we strive to innovate when there is that element of reward at the end of it or necessity or you, or necessity is the mother of invention that's true but in capitalism has completely now and, and our ah, minds have been triggered yeah, capitalism uh, yeah, yeah. Well, capitalism is a particular kind of economic and political system mm -hmm. that didn't always exist yeah so before Let's there was the game now, the mindset so before there was capitalism, people still invented things. Mm. Things people still had, still made advances in the way they produced things. Yeah. Uh, when the pyramids were constructed in Egypt, there was no capitalism. Mm. And in the future, there may be another social and political system which is not capitalism. So we ca we can't all the time be thinking. It's true that capitalism does force people to maybe to, to act in a certain way but as I keep saying it also produces a whole lot of problems yeah. along with the fact that yeah one person out of a, a million may become a millionaire mm -hmm. but most people don't most people go through their lives working yeah, paying off their mortgages yeah. worrying about their kids education yeah. worrying about what's going to happen when they retire yeah. worrying about we live in a constant stage of desperation, basically, where we're, where we're always working towards paying for the next thing, whether it will be the next bill, the next shoe, the next jacket. And, and we like, live in the fifth, mo fifth richest country in the world. In the world, yeah. So why, Most people why? don't have a saving of 500 pounds. Right. <laughs> so that shouldn't be necessary. If you look at the, the, the national wealth of Britain, there's enough there for everybody to live reasonable lives to have all the health care that is required but because the system is geared to taking most of that wealth and placing it in the hands of a handful of people mm -hmm. we go you know we go through life as i say most people go through life with all these problems and stresses and so on. and that's just looking at it from an individual point of view let alone looking about 
you know, environmental degradation, mm -hmm. pollution, racism, abuse of women, you name it, all which are all features of this society as well, mm -hmm. and which could also be eliminated if society was organized in a different way and if people had decision-making power, which yeah. they don't have. Yeah, this is super interesting. Um, so coming back on the, on the micro level, there, there was there's a question that's been playing in my mind and I thought I'll, I'll put it to you and see what, um, what you make of it. So I've been thinking a lot of recently about um, a, a lot of what's happening with um, the black youth in London particularly and in relation to like crime and, and violent crime. Um, what's your thoughts on it? And what do you think our biggest problem is at the, in, in current, if there is a problem, like within the community or is it external? Well, of course, there is a problem of, um, you know, violence. Um, that, that, that can't be denied. Whether it's a major problem, I don't know, but it's certainly a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's connected with um, it generally seems to be connected with, as I understand it, mm -hmm. it seems to be connected with uh, crime of one sort or another, generally, re generally drug related, mm -hmm. um, which is that, uh, you know, criminals make money out of um, drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the big criminals make money out of drugs. Yeah. <laughs> but the big criminals conduct their businesses by putting, mm -hmm. you know, young people, sometimes vulnerable young people, as their, mm. you know, their local sellers. Um, and then those, then there are kind of turf wars and people fight them out. So the, the, mm. the, the drug gangs fight them out. Mm. But the people who, get caught up in those turf wars and not the people at the top who are making Definitely lots of money not, but no. they're the, very often the people at the bottom or sometimes completely innocent people who just mm. got caught up and so on so I think anyway that's my understanding of mm. what is going on so again unless you deal with the problem of the drug industry as it is, which is a probably a multi-million pound or billion dollar, globally billion dollar industry, um, you know, these things are never going to be solved. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the drug industry is related to, you know, people at the top, you know, mm. not, not, not kids at the bottom, but people making millions and yeah. uh, organized crime and the corruption that goes along with it. So in government, in police, enforcement, and so on and so forth. And it obviously exists not just here, in the US, in the Caribbean, in Africa. Mm. Um, so I mean, that's one aspect of it. Then I guess another aspect of it is, um, you know, like what is what is the kind of future which is presented to young people, mm. and for some young people, is not much is being presented, mm. and so that leads some people maybe to go down a wrong yeah. path and you know get caught up in these things. So these are also products of you know the, again this this system which is everything is geared to money profit making um, is seen as the most important thing presented as the most important thing rather than um, you know other other aspects well, of, actually, of life yeah. so anyway that would be my yeah. kind of understanding of it yeah. and I mean at the same time you know for lots of young people there are um, You know, there have been so many cutbacks in other kind of provisions for young people, um, whether that's in education, the youth service. You know, when I was young, I used to work, I was a youth worker. And you'd probably find all the, you know, young kids who would come to the youth centre and anyway, whatever they were yeah. involved in. 
nowadays a lot of these youth centers are closed youth provision is closed they're non-existent right? so, exactly yeah. so you know maybe people young people then or some young people maybe become more vulnerable there's nothing to do they're on hanging on the street corner then yeah. home is not right as well and, yeah, yeah. So. i mean those you know homes not being right is also like another societal problem mm. um whether it's due to you know parents being unemployed or underemployed um you know families splitting up these are all problems which are socially produced mm. they're not just about individuals mm. um so the these are things which are kind of endemic in society and again you you have to look at how society is is kind of organized how it, it produces these problems mm. and it but it doesn't have any solutions to them yeah. um, so you know unemployment family breakup mm. drug related issues crime these are all mm. you know social problems yeah. which social problems meaning if you change the society or you change society's approach to things yeah. then these things can be most definitely. Have you have you heard the term the black pound before? The black so pound. So it, in, it, it's in relation to how long a pound stays within the black community. Um, I, I, I was I was reading an interesting stat which said I think in the Jewish community it stays. I think it, it changes hands six times, whereas in the black community I think it's like once or something. And um, the effect that has on the community um, as a whole in terms of like developing and growing. Yeah, but that's yeah. another. <laughs> That's another kind of aspect of capitalism, isn't mm. it? That that you could say money will go to to mm. money will go up the system. Yeah. So money goes money goes to money. Mm -hmm. um, so you could say in the black community, we, we can say um, to, to simplify things, mm -hmm. there are not many people who are owners yeah. of wealth or entrepreneurs or who produce things which people consume mm. or um, or have wealth of that kind mm. generally speaking um, you, could, you could if you looked at most communities it would be the same mm. um, and if you just look at it in terms of black and white or color it's a bit misleading because mm. if you looked at it in terms of wealth so it's if you looked at communities that are poor mm. um, and how much or how often a pound stays in communities that are poor it's not going to stay in them very long yeah. it's going to go to mr mcdonald yeah. or it's going to go to so is it is it economical thing it's an economic yeah, it's, a, it's a systemic yeah. thing mm -hmm. um that you know, it's it's going to go out of the poorest communities quickest, mm. somewhere else. Whereas amongst rich people, that money is going to yeah. remain there. Yeah. Um, so I think just looking at it in terms of, of black and white is a little is a little bit misleading. misleading you could mm. say, uh, although it's uh, it's undoubtedly true. Mm. But then, you know, most black people in Britain are working people, are poor, mm. don't have much. Um, so yeah, it's gonna go. It's gonna go out. Mm. Um, and again, if you looked at most white people, it's probably mm. the the pound is gonna go out of their local their local neighbourhood. Yeah. Um, it's gonna go somewhere else. It's gonna go to the supermarket. It's yeah. gonna go to the petrol station. It's gonna go. Yeah, because who owns a petrol station? Yeah. Who owns <laughs> Tesco's? Yeah. Who owns whatever the place where you get your food? Mm. Who are, who owns the you know? electricity or gas or these are you know big monopolies yeah um, so s some will say so th th there's obviously the system which we know is not um up to par how on a micro level can one improve so if if you was to advise sort of um so this is like my last leading question so if you was to advise like i don't know the next generation of youngsters coming up how how can they contribute to the betterment of society i think probably by getting together Mm. by discussing things by looking at the challenges and the problems that confront them mm. and 
finding a solution to those problems as a, as a collective. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes when, when people think about problems, they think about them as, as, an indi- as individuals, mm. which means either people kind of despair or they may find a solution which appears to solve their particular problem mm. at that time. But what's important is to think as a collective, how collectively can we um, solve, solve our problems, yeah. resolve these challenges? And then you find that you begin to look at them, as I said, you find that, okay, these problems as young black people maybe are not so much different or similar to those problems facing young white people as well, mm. because you know, it may be problems related to job, it may be problems related to housing, mm. maybe problems related to education, maybe problems related to health. These are all social problems that you can't solve as an individual. Some people think, okay, yeah, how do I solve my health problem? Well, I'll take care of health insurance, but that doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. It kind of maybe removes you slightly from it, but mm. The problem is surely having a health system that works for everybody or how do I solve the problem of education or I send my kids to a private school or whatever. The education well, problem hasn't been resolved. Uh, it doesn't resolve it. Mm. And most people can't do that and most people would, will struggle mm. to do that. Um, and then the education of society affects everybody. It doesn't just affect your kids mm-hmm. because it's going to affect those people that you interact with. Um, you want everyone to be educated, everybody to have an understanding of the world, everyone mm. to, um, you know, be enlightened about yeah. the world. So just looking after our own individual doesn't mm. address that, you know, or, you know, you, you can educate your kids, but how are you dealing with the pollution of the environment? Mm. Unless people think of these problems as collective or think of these as social problems that mm. need to be addressed collectively, then they're never going to be addressed and the system just kind of perpetuates itself. Because mm. it, it, one of the lies it tells you is that, well, you know, if you do this, you can get on mm. and you you can kind of... You um, leave everyone else behind and the problem is still there. Yeah, but yeah. The, the problem is, isn't resolved. Mm-hmm. And like we're talking about these problems of, of youth crime, you know, maybe you've educated your kid somewhere, but, you know, they're walking the street and mm. they may just be treated as any other black youth. Mm. Um, or they may be going past the police and the police are going to arrest them like any other mm. black youth. They're not going to say, oh, which school did you go to before they arrest them? <laughs> yeah. Or mm. which area did you grow up in? Or, you know, mm. so these are the kind of problems that we confront. And as I said, if we, if we look at Africa, you know, you, you find... Yeah, people living behind high walls, mm. people living in a certain area. But it doesn't stop, you know, unless you have the helicopter, yeah, the, the it doesn't stop the, you yeah, being in, yeah. the tra- in the go slow in Lagos yeah. um, and driving through a river when it rains and mm. um, or being, you know, mm. somebody coming and robbing your house. Mm. You know, the, the, the society is creating these problems and it's very, very difficult for us as individuals to escape mm. unless we have high walls unless we have a helicopter mm. but very few people are going to have helicopters yeah. it doesn't really make an enjoyable society to live in if you've got all those boundaries and blockades mm. yeah, exactly blocking for everyone else. exactly yeah. um, so you know okay some of us are you know some of us have been educated in a, mm. to a high level or whatever some of us yes have opportunities but where is our a kind of social conscience as it were mm. that okay what can we put back how can we contribute to mm. solving these things how can we help help others how can we lift others up mm. um, you know these are the you know the the, the important things I think mm. not not just how we can benefit but what can we do for others oh, to yeah. To, to try and address these and not problems. only is that helping others but it benefits us in the long run as we've discussed sure yeah. 
Yeah. I think so. Professor Hakeem, it's been super insightful. I mean, I, I would have loved to keep you here forever, but I know you've had an extremely long day <laughs> and you're tired as You'd it is. You'd have to feed me. That, that <laughs> yeah. Feed me. And... Yeah. But I'll definitely love to catch up again and sure. continue this conversation. Anytime. Because I know my listeners are going to take great value of it. I'm taking fantastic, great value from it because at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm consuming a lot of information. I'm, I'm talking to a lot of great and wonderful people and I'm learning a lot. And in learning, I'm... I'm figuring out ways to not only better myself but to better others and to better society as we discussed because it's not only about myself but it's about giving back because if I, if I go and buy a Rolls Royce and I leave my neighbour poor my neighbour's going to end up robbing my Rolls Royce and potentially killing me if I don't solve the problems that my neighbour has and that's yeah. something that I've taken from the conversation we've had today and it's been an absolute pleasure but um, before we go um, I know you've got a book launch coming up on the 16th mm -hmm. so would you want to just plug your book launch when is it where is it and what book is it I'm definitely going to be there by the we're way. launching diary. okay yeah. well it's at the Black Cultural Archives mm -hmm. in Brixton. Uh, people can find information online on Facebook, on Instagram. I'm going to have all the Twitter. links on the socials and the description under all of the yep. various um, um, places. Yeah. It's yeah, on the 16th of August from 6.30 to 8.30. And the book is called Black British History, New Perspectives. It's a, a book I've edited. So it contains essays by young up-and-coming historians most of them young black mm -hmm. historians um, looking at various aspects of mm. what we can call black British history so the history of black people in yeah. Britain so that's the next one coming up um, and then uh, as we said earlier I'm writing a book on that mm. history myself which will be published by Penguin hopefully will be out Mm. when I finish writing it. In a couple of years' time, <laughs> maybe. A time frame on that, yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. Welcome anytime. Oh, that was amazing, really.